Thank you for the invitation. Um, we switch from rare tumors and rare mutations, which, by the way, are also described in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, BRCA1-2 mutations, MUTOIA mutations, even in higher frequency than in colorectal cancer, but that's not the topic of my talk. I should talk about classification of neuroendocrine tumors and try to bring some order in the whole lot of different classifications which have been evolving like an uncut tree over the last years. And we will have, I will talk about the 2010 classification, which introduced the concept of neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine carcinomas. This is a classification which was made on GI neuroendocrine tumors, but also applied for pancreatic and now, I found this picture today in Amazon. I did not get my hard copies yet. The new 2017 classification of the WHO for neuroendocrine tumors is out. I will explain the new development of this concept. I will not talk about this branch, the lung, where we still use the same criteria as in 1999, discriminating typical carcinoids, which largely correspond to G1-net, but not exactly, atypical carcinoid and small cell cancer, so I will not cover this branch. I will briefly talk about staging, diagnosis and grading, which is the basis of the WHO classification. I will show evidences why did we change the classification again. I will introduce the NET G3, neuroendocrine tumor G3 concept, which is the biggest news of the classification which comes out, and the outlook. As you all know, neuroendocrine tumors are diagnosed due to their neuronal phenotype, similarities with neurons, which we demonstrate as pathologists by the expression of synaptophysin and chromogranin A, which can also be used as a biomarker, as a circulating biomarker. A big step forward in the classification was happening here in this nice uh, castle or in Frascati, now more than 10 years ago, where the grading concept was introduced and formalized. Uh, on one hand, mitotic count, Tumors with two or more mitosis in two square millimeters are graded as G2, and this is the same cutoff that is used for the lung for differentiation for a typical carcinoid and atypical carcinoid. What was introduced also is the grading based on proliferation, based on Ki67. This molecule is expressed in all the cells that are in the cell cycle and tumors between 3 and 20% of Ki67 are G2 tumors. More than 20% Ki67 are defined as G3 neuroendocrine neoplasms. This is not exactly corresponding to the 20 mitotic field, mitosis per 2 square millimeters, and, and I will come to these great discordant tumors that on one grading would be G2 and on the other would be G3. We have to count lots of cells, but that's a problem for the pathologist. And we have to select the highest areas, the proliferation spots, and this was an, uh, ev eminence based at the time point of the definition. Now there is evidence that this really makes sense. This is how this looks like. Uh, one endocrine pancreatic tumor. Here is one single positive tumor nuclei, 0.9%, sorry. Uh, so G1 tumor, G2, and G3. This is a tumor that is just on the borderline of G2, G3 with 25%. And actually, this is uh, the same patient as here. Uh, five years later, a relapse. So this is one tumor that progressed from this low G2 to this low G3 and this would be one of the net G3 tumors I come to later. Grading works. Uh, this is a multi-center study retrospective on several European centers for the effect of grading on prognosis for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Grading also works for ileal neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, the best significance is when grade is taken as a
continuous variable. It's up here, and actually, biologically, this makes a lot of sense because uh, proliferation is a continuous variable, and the faster a new endocrine tumor proliferates, the shorter the time to relapse or the higher the risk of relapse will be. So for me, the discussion is the cutoff better at 2%, 3%, or 5%. It's not very important. I think you need to know the exact number of proliferation. So this was the outcome of this uh, introduction of grading. It was taken in the WHO classification 2010. Neuroendocrine tumor G1, neuroendocrine tumor G3, and neuroendocrine carcinoma, uh, different names, small cell or large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, as in the lung, which are all G3 by definition. And then we have the mixed tumors. I will not talk about these today. So this classification 2010 is easy. Net G1, Net G2, Net G3. And what was added is staging concept. And I'm very happy that now with the new uh, HACC staging proposition that is out for half a year now, there is no discrepancy anymore compared to the ENET staging system. So we do not have the problem of having two different staging systems anymore. So that's the place we are. And if we look what is in this classification, we already have here in the 2010, a difference between tumor and carcinoma, which I will come to is differentiation as pathologists see it. There will be other things behind this. We have as another tumor, a grading with a cutoff of two ki 67 or two mitosis and we have the staging. So that's actually what we do for every tumor. And that was a big step forward in 2010. Why change again now seven years later? There is not one group of G3 tumors. And the first publication on this topic came from a US group. They did not do ki 67 in their clinical routine. So they did their grading all based on mitosis. And they looked up on a series of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, did ki 67 uh, afterwards, and they have a big group of grade concordance. So grading according to ki 67 this is by definition grade one, a uh, grade two, sorry, and they were grade two before based on mitosis. But there was a quite an important fraction of tumors that was grade two based on mitosis and now grade three based on ki 67 and the big fraction of grade three in both mitosis and in both methods. So what happens to these tumors that go into a different grade according to ki 67 and mitosis? Looking at lymph node positivity rate, they are very close to the G2 this uh, grade discordant. And more importantly, looking at two-year survival, we see a two-year survival of this group of patients of 74%, which is not the two-year survival we expect for neuroendocrine carcinoma G3, which is 22% two-year survival. So these tumors are biologically closer to the grade two pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. This study was done by pathologists, and they looked exactly how do these tumors look like. And they said the great discordant pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors under the microscope, they look like the well-differentiated grade two tumors. They make nests. They have these vessels that are associated very closely to the tumor cells, which is a sign of differentiation because this cell is made to secrete hormones to the vessel. They make these pseudoglandular structures. So this is they look like well-differentiated tumors, whereas the others uh, is the small cell or large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, which looks differently. ki 67 the rate of ki 67 is lower in the grade discordant than in the grade concordant, poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. And here you see the survival curves, which goes in between and does not have the, very, the patients that die very quickly out of these because of these tumors. A second important concept, and we start to see this more often when we start to re-biopsy tumors after treatment and during treatment, after many years of treatment sometimes, some of the tumors suddenly look like 
small cell carcinoma or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine high-grade carcinoma. And they looked at 31 of these pancreatic net where they had uh, both parts, some on, both in the primary and some had the high-grade neck part only in the metastasis. And the two and five year survival of these tumors having a region of neuroendocrine carcinoma by morphology still had an 88% two year and 49% five year survival. That's not what we know from small cell cancer. Looking at genetics, these tumors had DUX, HRX, and MEN1 mutation, the ones that progressed, whereas P53 and RP mutation was only found in a control collective of true poorly differentiated neuroendocarcinoma, which started from being poorly differentiated. We know for many years, actually, that poorly differentiated NEC, G3, are genetically different from NET. Uh, only, already 2012, it was described that the large cell and small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma harbor P53 and RB mutation in a very high frequency, 80%, whereas the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors have DUX, HRX, MEN1 mutations or mutations of the mTOR pathway. So out of this evidence, there is other groups having shown the same. I'm not able to show, to cite all the publications. The concept of neuroendocrine tumor G3 did arise. And it's important to be aware that net G3, tumors that look like well differentiated or are well differentiated under the microscope and have a high Ki67 only, and tumors that have progressed from a well-differentiated tumor to however they look, they behave differently from the primary NEC G3. To make the diagnosis of NEC G3 of importance is Ki67. This group has a Ki67 typically below 50%, but only typically. There is some cases with 80% here. Differentiation by morphology, which is also one part. It's not always the solution. Genetic markers, we have introduced in routine these two markers to be able to get for the pancreatic the well-differentiated genetics. Uh, this can also be done by panel sequencing, which costs more. And clinical history is also important. When the patient started with a neuroendocrine tumor G1 of a delium, and I also say of the ileum because this also exists in the ileum. This is not in the classification for the ileum, but there's anecdotal evidence, and I have seen quite some cases, and the more frequent we biopsy metastasis, the more frequently we see this. A progression from net G1, G2 to a high-grade tumor is not directly a neck G3. So this 2010 classification becomes old already, or seven years maybe it's not already, and we have an additional group uh, of neuroendocrine tumor NET G3, which is more aggressive than these, for sure, but is biologically close to these, has the same mutational background, and is different biologically from NEC. The concept of differentiation is what the pathologist sees differently under the microscope, is now better defined in the new classification. The grading is still there, and the TNM staging is still there. It's important to notice that the TNM grading for new endocrine tumors is only to be applied for these three, whereas the neck should be staged as the pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Take what do you take home from this concept? I think the concept of NET G3, this is a tumor that is genetically and morphologically different, uh, a group of well-differentiated NET. It is less aggressive compared to neuroendocrine carcinoma. Probably it is less responsive to cisplatin than neuroendocrine carcinoma. There is abstract evidence showing this, and you can interpret this in the Nordic, Nordic Neck study of Haftan Sorbe. It's not really scientifically proven yet, but I'm convinced this is the way it's going. We need clinical trials to see how, what do we do with these tumors because we don't know. Before, they were lumped into another basket. We have no good evidence yet what to do. We need this clinical trial. 
And this concept, which is now only valid for pancreatic net, will be implemented in GI. Lung will last maybe longer, but these tumors also exist in the lung in my experience. So this is the long way uh, the net classification went. Important steps is ki 67 introduction, which took 15 years until it went into the clinic here. We had the publications here, it went into the clinic here. Now we have the new concept of net G3. What comes next? I think this is the end of our thinking of evolving classification. Our next classification will be based on such data. This is different molecular subtypes on RNA level of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. We have four subgroups. Uh, on microRNA, we have two subgroups. And looking at methylation data, we have for sure uh, two or three subgroups of pancreatic net. We do not know what is the clinical meaning of these new things, but I'm convinced that this is the way the classification will evolve in the future. To go to get there, we need to collaborate better across institutions and across disciplines. We need to have clinical trials together with biobanks. Very often clinical trials run, are run without biobanks and we cannot learn do well translational studies on this. We need to know what happens to the patients we treat. Our European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society is very much involved in these parts and we need uh, biobanking efforts. Even if it costs at the beginning, we need this to get further. Thank you for your attention.